not being biased, this could probably be the most informative session <laughs> that you will be attending. So I'm Linda, I'm the leader of Cornwall. Very proud that we've got Spaceport launch in a couple of weeks' time. But anyway, we're here to talk about the integrated care system, progress in integrating health and social care. And that word progress, a very positive word for this discussion. So I'm very pleased to introduce, uh, in no particular order, but it does appear that I will be getting it right, Sean Hansen, who is the um, Chief Executive Officer from Empower. Uh, next to Sean is Chris Maxted, who is the Delivery Director for Empower. And I take this opportunity to thank you both for your collaborative work uh, with CCN. So thank you on that one. And then next to Chris, we've got Professor Claire Fuller, who is the Chief Executive of Surrey Heartlands Integrated Care System. And then to my right is Rachel Shimon, OBE, who is the Chief Executive of Buckinghamshire Council. Quick introduction. So, as we're working our way through the government's proposed reforms on adult social care, county and unitary councils are also working hard on the integrated care system reforms, which aim to bring together health and social care as part of a more joined up local care system. And I think the challenge, I'm going off piece to here in a minute, I think the challenge for most of us is to get to grips with ICS, ICB, and ICP. And once we all understand those, then progress will definitely be made. The experience of county and unitary councils to date has been mixed, and I'm pleased that CCN have commissioned our strategic part partner, Empower, to look at the progress made to date. This is based on interviews with both councils and NHS leaders, and aims to provide key learning for both partners so that we can get the most out of this opportunity. So I am pleased that we are joined by representatives from both the NHS and CCN who will share their views on both the research and I do hope reflect more widely on how the process is working. But first of all, I'm going to invite Sean from Empower to share the key findings from their research and I believe it's going to be a joint team effort uh, with Chris as well. So Sean and Chris, thank you. Uh, good morning, and thank you for Tim's introduction this morning, who has trailed the, uh, the publication of the report which has come out today. Um, today, we have published the report, The Evolving Role of County Authorities in Integrated Care Systems. This is a report, and you should all be able to get a copy of it online. Um, the report covers how councils work with the NHS, and it is increasingly the case that it's pushing itself to the top of the agenda. Empower sees it every day uh, in the work that we do across the country, be it designing new approaches to ensure that people get out of hospital quickly, and the work that we do in helping systems to understand their shared community spending and maximizing the return of that investment. That's why when CCN asked us to get involved in writing and reviewing and doing this report, um, we were very, very keen to work with CCN and be involved in this review. ICSs have been making a lot of noise in the NHS recently, but they're not looking at it particularly from the lens of local government, and that's what we've tried to do with this report. That local perspective is so important, but it is one that, as the report shows, often seems to be forgotten by central policymakers. So while we hope that this report will be useful to councils, as they grapple with the ways of working with the NHS, we also hope that it's useful for central government. At the autumn statement, the Chancellor announced a review of integrated care boards aimed at making sure that they have the autonomy to do what is locally right. I'm absolutely delighted that Tim has been asked to be part of that and that CCN therefore has got a role in giving your voice into that review. It's terrifically important. In the report, we cover four areas, expenditure and outcomes, governance, strategic delivery planning, and culture. We did this through a series of deep dive interviews with seven local authorities, talking to councillors, officers, and NHS representatives in each area. We also ran a survey of all CCN members and ICB chairs, and held a series of roundtables to get views from a broader pool of NHS and council leaders. And finally, we did our own research um, using publicly available data. In the report, we've tried to do justice to all of the different areas that were raised in our research, but given some of the complexities, 
we could probably need several hundred more pages to be able to cover all the different angles. You'll probably also be pleased to hear that the time given available today will only be able to discuss and look after a couple of uh, a small number of the report's findings. Those are the need for central government to embrace the devolution that it claims to promote, the extent to which ICSs represent true partnership working, and the increasing prominence of place in the NHS and council decision making. At that point, I'll now hand over to Chris, who will go into some details about how we did the report. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, before I go on to those three issues, uh, it's just worth setting out some context. This won't come as a surprise to anyone in this room, but on a national basis, the way the NHS and councils work together is, frankly, messy. In our research, we found that every council thinks about their ICS and the relative roles of different bodies within it differently. As one ICB, as one ICB chair told us, if you've looked at one ICS, you've looked at one ICS. <laughs> Some of this is natural, and it's been like this for a long time. It's a function of local priorities, pre-existing working arrangements, relationships, and so on. But some of it is because of the way ICSs have been designed. ICSs don't always map well to local authorities, and we found in particular that how boundaries were drawn uh, had a big impact on how ICSs were perceived. In the report, we've tried to bring some order to the different council ICS relationships by introducing a local authority ICS typology. Slide here. Ooh. There we go. This um, defines local authorities as one of four types uh, by their relationship to ICSs. In essence, are they coterminous? Do they share an ICS with one or two other councils? Do they share an ICS with three or more other councils? And finally, are they split across multiple ICSs? We found that there is significantly more variation in boundaries in counties than metropolitan areas. In metropolitan areas, the model is generally clear. Several councils clustered within one ICS. No metropolitan council is split across multiple ICSs, but this is common in counties. We use this typology as it helps to explain why things that work in one area might not in another. For example, in coterminous authorities, or those with only a small number of partners in an ICS, we generally found a closer relationship with integrated care boards and partnerships. This is perhaps unsurprising, but it's important to bear in mind when thinking about ICS best practice. The experience of a coterminous authority is likely to be different to that of a council working with five or six others in a single integrated care system. So it's messy. And that's worth setting out here up front because the need to cut through messy working arrangements was a theme in many of the findings in the report. The first of those findings that I'd like to highlight today is that central government doesn't yet appear to have recognized the complexity of the structures it has created. Time and again, we heard how it still behaves as if outcomes can be dictated through the center via a command and control approach rather than allowing for local autonomy. Both council and NHS leaders regularly told us that too much time is spent managing the centre, often in the form of NHS England, rather than working on local priorities. Ring fence, short-term funding pots, and regular new initiatives are a symptom of this. Government has created the ICS structures, but our first recommendation is that it now needs to step back and give those structures the chance to deliver on local rather than national priorities. The independent review of ICS as announced by the Chancellor last week is an excellent opportunity to start to tackle this. But a big question for local government is what their, what, is what their role is in determining the, and driving those local priorities. Our second key finding was that, by and large, ICSs still don't feel like true partnerships between councils and the NHS. The NHS element of, the, of integrated care boards in particular is still very much in charge of that body. All of the accountability structures in ICBs ultimately go through the ICB chair to NHS England and then to the Secretary of State. This is then reflected in the power structures in ICBs. As, for example, the chair can, in theory at least, decide how many and which local, authorities, which local authority members to have on the board. 
As such, ICBs don't, in themselves, create conditions for better partnership working. We regularly heard from councils that ICBs focus on NHS issues without sufficiently prioritizing the longer term, bigger picture. We found integrated, partner integrated care partnerships to be much more council-led and focused on longer term issues, but they don't have any formal decision-making power or funding and will ultimately be dependent on the ICB to drive major initiatives involving NHS resources. The good news is that by and large, councils and ICB leaders do have the same priorities. Better integrated services, more out of hospital care, and a focus on prevention. But this isn't new, and the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. ICBs haven't really been tested yet with, with difficult decision making. This winter will provide a first test, as will budget setting next year. It's not unreasonable to expect, whole, it's, it's not reasonable to expect wholesale reform of services overnight. But our research shows councils uh, are investing significant amounts of time in ICSs, and if they're only seen to deliver NHS business as usual, there is a big risk that councils will disengage. Our second recommendation is therefore that local systems should seek to push themselves this year to agree a small number of ambitions that can only be delivered by working together in ICSs. This should hopefully build confidence in ICSs to deliver real change, but it will also test whether there is genuine local ambition for, from NHS partners to do things differently. The third and final finding I will cover today is the importance that most local authorities attach to place-based partnerships. Our research showed that for many councils, these place-based partnerships were actually the key organization for planning and delivering integrated services. Nearly half of council respondents to our survey ranked place as the most important element in ICSs in delivering their objectives. For complex ICSs, it's where individual councils can get together with local NHS partners to agree on local joint priorities. Yet in most areas, there is no clear delegation of either funding or powers to place. The ICS legislation creates integrated care boards and integrated care partnerships, but is silent on place-based partnerships. As such, we found real concern that things that are planned and delivered through place at the moment are likely to be drawn upwards into integrated care boards, creating a move away from local and into regional. So our final recommendation for today is that councils should be clear on what they want place to mean in their area. Make sure that the ICB sets out what delegation it intends to make to place and then hold them to this. So, in summary, three points from me today are that, number one, government needs to deliver the autonomy to ICSs that it claims to champion. Number two, council should focus on a small number of realistic, tangible ambitions that it would like ICS partners to start delivering next year. And three, Council should be clear on how they want place to work in their area and aim to formalize this soon. As, as Sean mentioned, this is really only the tip of the iceberg on ICS working, uh, and I expect it will evolve significantly in the coming year. There is a lot more in the report. Um, I've only been able to cover a small amount of the things that we found today. Uh, we have copies here and online. And uh, I would encourage you to read it uh, and would be delighted to discuss any of its findings uh, with anyone here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Sean and Chris. And don't forget, we've got the technology of your app to get your questions in. So now I'm going to go over to Professor Claire Fuller to respond. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Have to make sure I don't fall off the back. There's this precipitous gap down there. So just if any of us disappear, that, that's where we are. So good morning. I, I'm Claire Fuller. I am a GP from Surrey, and I'm also the chief exec of Surrey Heartland's Integrated Care System. So to help with Linda's learning goal straight away, um, I have within our ICS, I have two statutory boards. I have an integrated care board with a chair, um, Ian Smith, and I have an integrated care partnership with the chair, Tim Oliver. I consider myself to have two chairs of equal importance and two statutory boards that are equally important to me as the chief executive of the system. 
Now, I think Chris beautifully summarised sort of that, the, the role of the ICB and how it very much sort of feeds up into region NHSE and then up into, um, and then up into uh, DHSC. But actually, where the real difference and real impact for our population will happen will be around the integrated care partnership. So I'm going to talk to you today about three things, really. So number one is just give you a little bit... Well, I've got Tim sitting straight in front of me. I, I just need to give you a few headlines about Surrey. Uh, number two, I'm going to make the case for neighbourhoods as actually being the unit of delivery rather than place. And then uh, number three, I'm going to give you reasons for optimism and why actually I think the timing of this report is absolutely spot on combined with the Hewitt Review. And I think we have a real opportunity at the moment if we join together to actually bring about change. So, Surrey, we are the most affluent ICS in the country, which is a very much a double-edged sword. If you look at us from the moon, you'll think that everybody in Surrey is doing incredibly well. But within that, and our outcomes are some of the best outcomes in the country. However, within that, we have got real pockets of inequalities. And there are people in Surrey that will do less well in Surrey than they will do in many of your places. So if you look at our Gypsy Roman traveller population, if you look at our learning disabilities population, there are significant gaps in life expectancies and healthy healthy years lived but and also the you know you can go in Epsom you cross the railway line and your life expectancy drops by 15 years that's not acceptable is it to any of us but if we continue to work in the way that we always have worked which would be putting in place blanket interventions the old approach we had to prevention it won't work so what we need to do is we need to be more effective at targeting those communities that need our help the most. And it is those communities that have also been disproportionately impacted by COVID. There are also those, those bits of our communities that are also most affected, uh, the most digitally excluded. So we've got this doubling down each time of these communities that we need to look after in a completely different way. So in the summer, I published a report called Integrating uh, Primary Care, The Next Steps. I was asked by Amanda Pritchard, who's the chief exec of NHS England, to write a report looking at primary care within ICSs. So what's working, why it's working, and how we can replicate it. And the report really looked to solve two problems. And they're two problems that I think we've already heard uh, you hear in every sort of conversation, every political conversation. It's how do you square off access and continuity? So while, I was, while we were writing the report, um, there were two things that happened. We had the British Social Attitude Survey was published, which showed for the first time the public were less satisfied with the NHS than they were satisfied first time ever in our history. And we also had the GP survey that showed a massive drop in satisfaction with uh, GPs, right, right the way down to the dentists, which is unheard of. We normally sort of sit sort of 10, 15% above. So how do, we, how do we fix these things? But actually, access and continuity they're two sides of the same coin and you'll all have experienced this so you you want to see someone you want to make an appointment and you do the 8am scramble you phone and you can't get through or you do get through and they say phone back at two so you phone back again i don't know how many times you will do that but but there will come a point where you have to make the decision about seeing someone more quickly that you don't know and that you haven't met before or waiting and waiting longer to see somebody that knows you and actually, my children, who are what, in their early 20s, they don't care who they see. And actually, they don't have long-term conditions. And they're quite happy to have transactional care from anybody, probably digital, probably online, but they want it now. My parents are in their late 80s and have got an arm full of long-term conditions and want to see someone that knows them and understands their lives in the context of where they live. So they will wait. But actually what happens is those people that end up waiting the longest are those people that need to be seen soonest. So we need to organise the way we deliver care in a different way to make sure we don't, uh, we don't worsen the outcomes for our most vulnerable populations. So in the report we talk about neighbourhood teams. Now many of you will, I know as, um, many of you will have learned to speak a little bit of NHS and you'll know that we like three letter acronyms. So I give you PCNs, primary care networks. So PCNs are collections of GP practices that come together to serve a population to 30 to 50,000. In the report, we talk about the evolution of PCNs into integrated neighborhood teams. Now some PCNs are already working as a really functioning um, integrated neighborhood team, but some aren't. And those that aren't are those that still 
and essentially the primary care networks are just a series of contracts that are held between NHS England and individual practices that mean you get sort of two hours of a paramedic, three hours of a pharmacist in an individual surgery that has no impact on the workforce and no impact on patient outcomes. So we talk about how you make better use of those additional roles, but also combine them with other people that work within a geography to better meet the needs of the population. So we talk about creating integrated neighbourhood teams that improve access, it's integrated urgent care. How you create a team that may be led by a GP that includes pharmacists, that includes the other additional roles and includes digital access and, and making sure that people can choose how they access care in a way that works for them. We talk about creating teams around our most vulnerable patients that will be teams made from multi-organisations, including adult social care, including voluntary sector, including secondary uh, community care, including mental health services. And then we talk about how we work with our communities to actually deliver improvement in health inequalities. And this is building on the work that we did during the pandemic, so the fantastic vaccine programme that actually worked with communities to deliver vaccines in a way that worked for people. So delivering vaccines outside the mosque, going to the Gypsy Roma Traveller Church, going down to the taxi rank in Hawley to the Bangladeshi taxi community. Unless we understand our local communities, we can't ever properly address the health inequalities in a way that will stick. That's integrated neighbourhood teams, but the thing for them to thrive and to actually work is for us to create the right environment. And this is about ICSs, this is about ICBs and ICPs. So we need data. And we need data sets to help us identify our most vulnerable people. And that's not an NHS data set. That is a broader data set. Imagine if you had the knowledge and information about, the pe about our people that goes across the local authority data, the adult social care, the district and boroughs, even the schools and the police. How much better we would be able to pinpoint our most vulnerable in our societies and protect them. Second one, workforce. At the moment, we know the best way to improve somebody's actual health outcomes is actually to give them a job. It doesn't matter whatever else we do. If you give somebody a job, you will improve their health outcomes. At the moment, we poach between health and between care and between health organisations. We need to work together to recruit. Health and care will be the biggest employers within your areas. We need to work together to provide, to provide career aspirations and to describe careers for people so that you can start as a receptionist and end up as a end up as a GP so you can start as a carer and end up as a, a director of adult social care but we need to make it easier for people in non-registered roles to add on skills to create a real portfolio way of working that is sustainable so we don't lose people and then thirdly estates so estates within primary care have been willfully neglected for all of my career I've done I've done uh, surgeries in cupboards more times than I would like to remember. Um, and even in one surgery, we had to, the disabled access was through the bins. You know, it is, it is just unacceptable. But because general practice is poorly understood by the NHS and because of the way capital works within the NHS, pots of money come down at the end of the year rapidly. And general practice and primary care do not have the uh, the capability or the capacity to bid for those pots of money. So we need to do it differently. But this needs to be not just about NHS estate, not even just about one public estate. This needs to be about communities working across the commercial sector and across one public estate to be delivering services for people within geographies that matter to people. So, integrated neighbourhood teams. Why I am excited about the timing. So the... Um, so the, the report was actually published by all, was signed by all 42 ICS chief executives. So for the first time ever within NHS history, we have got a report co-designed, co-written and signed by the entire leadership community across the NHS. It's also been endorsed by the NHS board, which means we have got a commitment to access, continuity and improving health inequalities across the board. We've then got the Empower report that, uh, that helps describe how we could do things differently working with local authority and we've got the and we've got the Hewitt review if we can line up and combine all of those three things I think actually we stand a chance of finally turning things and starting as a conversation we have earlier to move to a health service rather than an unhealthy service so thank you very much <clears throat> Thank you.
so um, Claire, your timing was impeccable. I was <laughs> ching and thinking I might have to interrupt here. But now I'm going to invite um, Rachel Shimon uh, to respond. Thank you. Okay, well, lovely to see so many old friends here in the room today. And first of all, thank you so much for those councils, elected members and colleagues who were part of this research. It's a really, really good read. So I've worked very closely with the NHS for about 25 years. I know, amazing to believe. Um, and I wanted to flag to you what I saw as some of the key characteristics in working with the NHS that would give us the best chance to really move the dial for our communities. And before I say what I'm about to say, my disclaimer to you is I absolutely love working with the NHS, so take my comments in that spirit. Now, when we were trying to determine how we ran this session, I challenged some of my CCN colleagues to come up with a song title that they thought best encapsulated the issues around working with the NHS. Now, I couldn't come up with one, so I've got more than one in this presentation, and I've also got hidden within the script other popular music references, so bonus points for anybody who spots them all. ICBs are the most recent in a very long line of acronyms. The ones that I can remember, and I'll just have to look down to remind myself, are CCGs, PCTs, PECs, SHAs, DHAs, FHSAs. You will remember many more of them. I'd like to think that I'm not the only person in this room today who in the last couple of years has lost track of our distinct role in local government and our remit as part of the ICPs, PBPs and ICBs, not least because at a point in time in the last two years, those acronyms were interchangeable. The rearranging of the deck chairs, there you go, Claire, the NHS reference, Claire knew I was going to have that. Uh, and a lack of co-design at the outset, so great news, Tim, that you've been asked to become involved in that review. Together with the communication about change, that trickles down rather than is clearly cascaded, causes me some considerable confusion, and I suspect some of us too, as well as actually causing some confusion within the NHS about what's happening next in terms of governance. It feels to me as if every time there's a structural change, we do risk seeing a slowing of progress as each new set of chairs and board members and CEOs reviews and plans in accordance with the latest NHS plan and those inevitable top-down targets. It's a point of fact, actually, that many letters that come out from the NHS central body to chief execs of councils never actually reach us, and we are dependent on our local NHS colleagues to pass them to us. Now, I've raised that with NHSE many times. I'm sure others have. Nothing changes. Uh, how hard could it be, really, to just get a list of us all from the LGA? So, as with most things, when there is an overt lack of communication, and in this context, more importantly, proactive engagement, suspicion rather than trust can start to flourish. And that sense of collegiate working, uh, rather than them and us, we know is developed over time and takes quite a lot of investment, not least from some people who may in fact be the new kids on the block in our system. Do you see what I did there? New kids on the block? Yeah. And just as our own residents feel frustrated if we fail to co-design solutions, we want to have an ability to be part of the forming stage well before we get into storming. When the heat's on, the relationship bedrock of our partnerships are critical and developing that foundation we know takes time and effort. The trust element of that work is going to become ever more critical as sources of funding that are nationally badged as adult social care are in fact passported through the ICB. So how will that money really be allocated who is going to decide how that money is going to be allocated? I think in Surrey it will work one way. I'm sure in Bob, my ICB, it will work quite differently. What are the mechanisms going to be if we as individual places don't agree with those allocations? And how transparent will that decision making be? And that money, let us not forget, used to previously come down to councils in relation to innovation and about three years ago started to be passported very differently. 
Half of the councils who responded to our survey said that partnership working felt at the minute about the same following the creation of ICSs. And for many of us, ICSs don't quite yet feel like a paradigm shift towards delivering truly local priorities based on our collective engagement and involvement. To what extent do we think that they are joint endeavours at the moment or NHS bodies with some local government participation? We work with the NHS, a service with the budget the size of a small country, a service generally uh, held dear and a service which of course is in reality an amalgamation of organisations run by management teams, run by boards and in the case of GPs, private businesses. We do want to feel some sense of parity in local government. It's interesting, isn't it, that mental health and learning disability services, both NHS services that cross over with local government, can feel like the Cinderella of the NHS still. And so too do we in local government sometimes feel as if we continue to be a junior partner. I am biased, of course, but Cinderella, in my view, was the most virtuous of those sisters, uh, constantly seeking to do the right thing, when sometimes everything around her felt unfair and sometimes ever so slightly chaotic. Uh, in a system that works positively for our residents, we want to be seen as different but equal. And that's politically important, in my view, given the local political mandate and the way in which we can genuinely, in local government, tailor our services and our local strategies to meet the needs of our local people. There is, unfortunately, at present, very little focus on place in national policy. And at the time that this research was written, uh, just one of the 14 pieces of guidance on NHS issues issued by the NHS uh, England organisation addressed place and although our NHS partners are keen to emphasise the importance of place this research in fact found very few examples of clear delegation plans or funding powers uh, and place in many areas is still acting largely as a continuation of previous arrangements uh, so perhaps that will come to all of us over time, but we're going to need to proactively engage to make that happen. In very practical terms for both elected members and managerial colleagues, changes in structures will mean, does mean, that we've got to invest more time in developing relationships. Uh, and I would suggest in the NHS that needs to appreciate uh, the starting point uh, is known. It's generally well understood in place. Uh, sometimes individuals, uh, systems take us into difficult and contentious issues. The issues we work on with the NHS uh, are tanker turning territory, building on rather than reinventing those issues we need to resolve ensures that we can sustain some momentum. So do we need to be involved in every single thing the ICB does? Well, my contention is no, we don't, just as we don't need the NHS to be involved in every single aspect of local government functions. There are, of course, really key issues in both local government and NHS territory that require a clear lead from either or both of us, issues that impact heavily on the whole system, issues that absolutely need joint working, planning and execution. And determining which aspect of NHS policy fits into each category requires a really open and mature debate and openness across the partners about what is actually on the stocks. And as the research has found, what are the key things that we are going to work on together? And so as we have that debate, excluding local government from them, which is happening in some places, or asking for a single sector representative from local government at a board level, when those debates are happening, doesn't actually build trust or collaborative behaviours. The NHS will undoubtedly continue to further refine and morph and change in its governance structures at a local and a regional level in the years ahead. With only a few exceptions, some of us in this room, local government and in fact the hospital sector continues to retain pretty much form and function, as well as being in possession of very detailed quantitative and qualitative knowledge of communities, voluntary sectors uh, and community sector organisations as well as wider 
partnering bodies on the ground. And despite those many iterations, what's gone before in relation to ICBs, stubborn inequalities are persisting in all our communities, even in Surrey. Um, the length of stay in hospitals remains too high. Specialist staff are in short supply. We need a really mature conversation at a place on a national level about some of those wicked issues. We all need, though, despite some of the challenges, to continue to work collectively on wellbeing on access to services, on the promotion of independence and on reducing inequality of outcomes and increasing access to our services. There will be inevitable challenges in working with the NHS and no doubt more organisations within the NHS will bite the dust. But we've got to maintain our sense of direction, our time, commitment and energy to the communities we serve. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Rachel. Now we're coming to questions and answers. And while people are thinking, am I brave enough to put a hand up? I'm going to come in with a question that come, has come in on the app. And I'm actually going to go to Rachel, um, if I may. And this is, um, how do we get the NHS to understand the budgetary constraints which are faced by local government, which appear not to apply to the NHS? <laughs> Well, um, I, I guess part of the risk in, in <coughs> people understanding the budgets is that they don't think that the budget is something to be ready to prop up the NHS. And I think that is a real concern. And that depends whereabouts in the country you are and which individuals you are working with. I, I think the first step for me is ensuring that chairs and chief executives of ICBs, together with whoever your place-based lead is, has a really decent understanding of some of the financial challenges <coughs> that we face. And I do think our financial challenges are complicated. Uh, when we sit down in Buckinghamshire to go through our budget, and it will be the same for everybody else in this room, I think if most people just wandered in off the street and looked at the level of risk we carry, the complexity of funding, some of the really difficult political decisions that have to be made, for example, in relation to council tax levels, uh, it would blow their minds, frankly. So I guess my approach would be to ensure that those individuals working in the ICB are helped to understand why our budgets are complicated, are helped to understand why if funding goes through the ICB, we don't just want a flat percentage allocating to us, and to really understand that if we want to stop ambulances backing up, and if we want to encourage discharge, that's genuinely a whole system issue that actually starts not just with admission dis avoidance or discharge, but in much more fundamental work in terms of ensuring people stay independent for longer. Lovely. Uh, I can't see your hand, so I've got a plethora of questions here. So what one change would the panel make to bring place into consideration meaningful, as has been identified as a current gap? So I think I'll go to uh, Sean, if I may, on that one. Thank you. Yeah, I think in terms of the report and certainly the, uh, the feedback that we got was that in it, there was a very different sort of attitude to place. And a lot of that is based around the typologies and the typographies that we are, when we represented earlier. Um, understanding of place and understanding, and I looked around whenever we were, uh, we actually had that slide up on the screen and people were trying to place themselves and try to see where they sat in that. But it's, it's really clear that that messy system makes it very difficult to understand place. So I think one of the things that needs to feed into the Hewitt review is a clear understanding of how that, typo that typology affects the place-based decisions and the understanding of that. And my, my one thing that I would do is to make sure that that system is understood in the NHS as to how difficult it is to operate in that type of environment. Lovely, thank you. Um, oh yes, there is a hand going up. So you... Hi. Lovely, thank you. Uh, right, my name is Pete Sudbury and I have to confess that I'm a doctor. And um, in fact, I spent 30 years before I became a counsellor as a psychiatrist. Um, and some time also working for Hewlett Packard as their um, health care uh, advisor. Uh, and I was a medical director for 12 years of that. I loved Claire Fuller's presentation. I thought it was brilliant. And I thought it was brilliant 10 years ago when I heard it. And probably 15 years ago <laughs> when I heard it. 
That's and the issue. it was the sort of thing that got me out of bed in the morning and I, I and everybody else in the system really drove for it and we failed each time. We absolutely failed to, to tip the power balance away from acute, acute medicine. And I think there are two things that, that help that. The first is the failure to distinguish between, between structure, process, and outcome. Those of you who know Don Obedian will, rem will remember that, that we always think that if we fiddle with the structure, it'll make a difference to outcome. That's absolute hogwash. Uh, if anything, it just causes chaos in this structure. And the second thing, actually, is that the implicit model of healthcare that almost everyone carries around, particularly politicians, but actually even the health people I worked with in HP who'd been in health IT for 10 years still think of healthcare as like casualty or ER. Broken patient comes in, magical thing happens, thank you doctor, and it's always a doctor, thank you doctor, you saved my life. Of course, 80% of healthcare costs are uh, long-term conditions. There is no equivalent television show for public health or primary care, which actually need to be the linchpin of the hinge, and yet are the things that we don't invest in, and mental health, actually, I might say. Uh, and somehow, somebody actually has to take the knife out and start to make that happen, because you won't make that happen by saying nice speeches. I know that because I've seen these, these, these before. So what's different this time? Uh, actually, just one more thing. The uh, the FT published a, a, a review of evidence on the health service. We spend as much as other major health services. What we don't spend it on, we're a real outlier on, is prevention and community services. So how, how Claire and Rachel, who, who actually said nothing changes as well, and Rachel and Claire, how are you going to make it different this time? <coughs> So, Claire, if you'd like to come in first, thank you. Fabulous. So, um, a great question. So, just not wishing to, um, uh, to expose daytime TV watching, but of course, there is doctors and there was peak practice when we started. And there was always that Australian one as well when I was growing up. So, there are, of course, uh, primary care equivalents of, of, de of TV programs. Oh, and Doc Martin, of course. So, yeah, so anyway, so how are we going to do this differently? So, number one, and I'll come back to, this feels different because we have got alignment across the whole footprint, which I have not had in my whole career. So for 10, for 15 years. So all 42 ICS chief executives, the NHS England board, the NHS chief executive and NHS England chair, plus the timing of the Impower Report, plus the timing of the Hewitt Review, I think that is what makes this different. And the two things that we have to do, and I'll come back to why neighbourhood teams are important as well as place is, we've got to turn off the demand. So, you know, it's a classic, slightly cheesy analogy, but we are constantly mopping the floor, aren't we? We've got to turn the tap off. And the only way we do that is actually by doing the prevention. And the only way the prevention will work is if we target it to those people that need it. While we wait for that, while we wait to turn off the demand and for the money to shift, we need to use our workforce differently. So the majority of the money in the NHS is spent on people. We need to use our people in different settings. They need to not just work in a big shiny hospital. So they might very well think that they work in secondary care, but actually we need to have our psychiatrists leading multidisciplinary teams within our neighbourhoods, looking after our most complex patients and their most complex needs. We need to have uh, we need to have physiotherapists following patients out from the hospital out into the community. So let's use the people while we wait for the money to then follow them, but we've got to turn off the tap. <clears throat> so, Rachel, if you'd like to respond, and then I've got a killer question to end the session with from Steve Foster, which I think will echo what a lot of us want to ask. So, Rachel? How exciting. Yeah. Uh, so... Um... <laughs> <laughs> My last slide was everything changes with you and that is exactly the point I was making. 15 years ago I sadly found myself having exactly the same conversations that we're having today. I do think though an alignment of structures and governance is important. They won't matter though if the behaviours aren't different and I think that's the key issue. One of the other things that I think is different now, though, is that a number of hospitals do run community services. So if they have an integrated management team and they think and talk about those issues, I think it's given 
acute chief execs a better insight into what happened in communities. And in fact, locally for us, our acute chief exec is part of our growth board and involved in lots of discussions on a place level. So there's something for me about collegiate behaviours have to go alongside the structural underpinning that the governance uh, the, the governance will uh, change through the ICB world. Um, the other two things, though, that I just want to draw attention to are um, it does feel so ironic, doesn't it, that the minute public health moves into local government, the budgets are cut in real terms. Now, how, how does that make any sense to any of us when we know absolutely that getting upstream of all of those issues that drive acute demand that soak up the cash requires really thoughtful spend and consideration about the strategies that are going to work. And the second issue for me is, I am very nervous about the government continuing to run money through uh, the Better Care Fund. Um, I'm not sure that it's particularly helpful for some parts of local government in some places when there is a fundamental crisis in social care that we still are not able to address because we're not funded to do so. Thank you. <clears throat> so this question is just going to take us over our time slot, but it's a good one, Claire. Yeah. As prevention is better than cure, will ICS actually be able and willing to deliver some of their funding to councils to focus in helping people at an early stage reducing future care needs? So, so I don't see why it should just be the responsibility of councils to actually deal with prevention. I think it is the responsibility of individuals where they live. I think it is also, as a GP, I feel prevention is absolutely part of my core business. So I think, again, we're being too binary, and that's where we keep going wrong. We keep going, it's either NHS or it's council. It's not, it's both and it's more. Thank you. So we've come to the end. I never thought I would come to an integrated care system, health and social care debate where Elvis Presley yeah. featured. Yeah. So my parting messages to you um, is when you get a correspondence from the ICS, have that suspicious mind. You will be all shook up, but you're going to survive and love me tender. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. <laughs> You're working. I'm a bit. Um... It's just a little bit small, small yeah. But it's, it's okay. I think that. Ah, that's better. Yeah, that's perfect. Good afternoon. Hello. Can I? Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to the uh, next session. And those of you who don't know me, I'm Councillor Keith Glazier. I'm the leader of East Sussex County Council and uh, spokesperson for children on CCN. And very pleased to be here today. And uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce. Um, Dame Rachel uh, D'Souza, who is the Children's uh, Commissioner for England. And uh, 
This year, as I'm sure we all know, that um, Dame Rachel is currently leading the Big Ask, a national survey of England's children. Children's social care continues to be a real area of focus for the CCN and its members. And as we seek to deliver the best possible care for our young people, this is within a context of increasing financial pressure, both within children's services, but across the full range of services that we're required to provide for residents. So Dame Rachel is here today to provide an insight into the results of the Big Ask, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about what councils can learn from this vital listening exercise of our ch from our children and young people. So welcome, uh, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks so much, Keith, and thanks everybody for being here, and it's great to be here to talk to you all and speak with you. Um, I'd like to begin, really, by reflecting on the last few years, which have been an incredible period of upheaval, social, economic upheaval for all of us. And as a former teacher and head teacher and chief executive for 31 years and now Children's Commissioner for England, I've witnessed firsthand the impact that this has had on our children. I'm sure you have too. And I feel strongly, along with you, that they made huge sacrifices during the pandemic. They missed out on crucial learning and development opportunities in school, the chance to make friends, um, and those all important life experiences. So coming out of the pandemic, I was acutely aware of how important it was to put children front and center of recovery. And as adults, I think sometimes we all, and I'm guilty of this, think we know best what, for what children want. But I wanted, when I became Children's Commissioner 16 months ago, um, to ask them, to ask the children of England what they needed to thrive as they came out of the pandemic, what their barriers were, and what they wanted. I couldn't resist asking them what they wanted for their futures and what their hopes and dreams were, and how we could help them realize that. So to, that was my homework. Um, so last year, I launched the Big Ass Survey, a survey for all children in England aged 4 to 17. So I could hear about their aspirations, the things they care about, and what they think is holding them back. And the response we had was incredible. It seared on my mind, on my soul. 557,077 um, responses. So with over half a million responses, it's the largest survey of this kind conducted in the world, apart from the US Census. Um, we received responses from every local authority, every parliamentary constituency. So about 6%, 6 to 7% overall um, of children between that age group in the country, but no fewer than 3% in every local authority area. Um, and that included thousands of children in care, young carers, 94,000 children with additional needs, um, and just every, I mean, we were, we were able to really analyze the data by pretty much every group. And it's the scale of the response, as well as the honesty, that provides us with, I think, a, gen, a, a genuine, but also reliable insight into the lives and thoughts of the children of England. And the really amazing thing, and the thing that, people often say to me, what surprised you the most? Um, what surprised me the most was that whatever background, whatever the part of the country, whatever circumstances those young people came from, children came from, their answers were the same. And, you know, even whatever, they told us they valued their community, they valued making a better world, they talked about they prioritised their health and well-being, future jobs, skills, family, and most important, their education. And, and specifically, their number one issue for them, their burning issue, one in five was, don't forget, they were just coming out of lockdown, was their um, mental health well-being. And that was very much about coming out of isolation. Secondly, it was education, life at school, a real desperation to catch up. Um, to have the opportunities that they needed to create the world for, that they wanted for their futures. And community came, came in massively, places to go, things to do that were affordable. Um, and, you know, no child wrote, I want a shopping mall. It was about games, sports, playing together, being together, spending time together. It was really very strong. And for their futures, um, their, the absolute number one thing was great job, great career. That was 74% of respondents. And then family, community, friends. And in fact, one of the reasons they were so worried about education in terms of a barrier was because they were worried about failing. 
They were prepared to work hard. They wanted to work hard, but shouting out of those pages was support, support, support. We're going to roll our sleeves up, but we need the help to, to achieve what we need to achieve. So family, one of the first big key themes. The Big Ash showed just how important a loving, stable and supportive family life is to children, both now and for their future. But it was also clear that children were worried about stresses at home and wanted more support for their families when they were struggling. So when the government commissioned me to do a review of family life in England, I didn't think twice. I wanted to understand how families speak about themselves, who is in the family unit and what families want. Um, and again, we got this fantastically coherent picture coming back. You know, families talked about themselves relationally. They talked about, what does family mean to you? The answer was love, everything, support, people you can rely on. Um, and how did they describe family? Family was so much more than the way we, um, well, the way the government collects data on families, which is by household. It was, yes, mum, dad, granny, granddad, uncle, the couple down the road that you respect so much that you call them auntie and uncle, my dog, um, the community leaders who, who, who really support, whether it's the football coach, whoever. And I wanted to capture this. And so often we talk about family when it goes wrong and as part of the problem. And actually, I wanted to turn that round and talk about family as the solution, the thing we should be proactively supporting. So earlier this year, I published my independent family review, which I think defines what's so important about family. It's protective effect. We studied all the open, you know, millennial cohort studies, as well as doing nationally representative surveys. Um, you know, and we found out some really, um, some worrying, but also some interesting and uh, facts about how, uh, that can really help us in terms of how we work with families. Um, children born in 2000, 44% of them have at one time um, in their childhood not lived with, their with at least one of their biological parents. That shows a lot more change in dynamism than perhaps census data does. Um, compared to 20% of those born in 1970. Similarly, that's a, that's a big change. Um, so we, we, we found some very interesting things. We also found that if you have a good relationship with your parents, or at least one parent, not only we knew you did better in exams, you also earn more at 25. So really interesting data starting to come out there. Um, so protective effect, whatever economic decile you're in, we've found through our study that that um, you know, if you can rely on your family, your happiness and well-being overall, whatever age you are, is better. You might say that's obvious, but we've we've shown it. Um, and I'd, so, please do take a look at it. I'll be publishing part two of my review next month, which will be focusing on delivering services that are designed around children and families. What did families tell me about services? They wanted services that well, well the first place families told me they turn to when they're in trouble uh, is their family. The second place, friends. And then when they have to turn to services, they told me they wanted them to be local, reliable, relational, just like um, families. So now I think is the time for us to make that change. And if we can get family right, I truly believe everything else can flow from there. And that's family in its broadest sense. Remember, that was defined so widely there. So community. I'm sure it doesn't come as a surprise to you that this generation of children are civic-minded, social, and outward-looking. In fact, the positivity positively beamed from their responses. They told me they care deeply about their neighborhoods and improving them, that they want their lives outside of home and school to be made safer, and they wanted to be treated fairly. Children should feel safe to play, to have fun in their communities, both online and offline, no matter where they live. And most importantly, they should have confidence in the adults whose job it is to protect them. You'll all be aware of the appalling treatment of child Q, who was strip searched in her school by serving police officers with no appropriate adult present. I've since used my um, powers to obtain and publish Met Police data on the strip searching of children, which revealed that in far too many cases, appropriate adults were not present and rules were not followed. 
I was so concerned about the lack of safeguards in place. I've expanded my focus to the strip searching practices of every police force in England and Wales and asked Mark, Sir Mark Rowley to support me and show leadership in this. Um, and I'll be publishing this data in the new year. I want officers to see their statutory duty to safeguard children as a priority and recognize that every interaction they have with children is a chance to protect rather than criminalize. And children told me in the big ask, they want to respect the police and see them as authority figures, people who will protect them and keep them safe. And just as I take children's safety in the offline world really uh, uh, seriously, I also take their, their safety in the online world equally seriously. And I, I, I mean, I've spoken recently in the last few weeks to the parents of Molly Russell and the parents of Frankie Thomas and, you know, see so many children drag down dangerous avenues into a world, an, a, an, an online world that's been allowed to run wild. Now, my team is currently exploring the role that online pornography plays in sexual assaults children suffer, because I'm so concerned about the effect on children of what they're viewing online. And that's from, you know, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds telling me completely without, you know, seeking it, you know, being exposed to pornography online. I'm very concerned about this. And this is why we need the online safety bill now. This landmark, landmark legislation provides us with a once in a generation opportunity to protect all children, particularly the authority, uh, particularly the vulnerable. And I've been pushing hard to that. And we've done much research in this area. And tr trust me, talking to, you know, thousands of children, you know, my hair stands on end, the things I hear. Uh, you know, we need to do more there. I want this legislation now, I want it quickly, and I look forward to us all getting behind it at a crucial moment to do all we can to protect children online. In the words of Molly Russell's father, Ian, it's time to protect our innocent young people instead of allowing platforms to prioritize their profits by monetizing their misery. Now, I'm not just speaking to you about it from this platform. Um, I also see the tech companies um, every six months and challenge them personally to give me information too. And I've worked hard to try to get change in this area and I'd really value your support. So over to jobs and skills. Now, I told you, didn't I, the number one thing our children want for their future were great jobs, great careers. So the big ask revealed just how ambitious England's children really are. They value hard work and ambition. They want access to opportunities. They want to work hard to get good jobs and careers when they get older. As one child told me, I expect great things from myself. In the wake of the pandemic, we need to work particularly hard to ensure that all children, especially those from disadvantaged backgrounds, have the means to make this success happen. I want to see a cradle to career approach in education, including a stronger focus on vocational routes. It was interesting. I did meet the next two prime ministers when I was talking to children. I mean, I went out and talked to kids when I was doing the big ask from Grimsby to Scunthorpe to Carlisle to Manchester to Liverpool, you know, Bristol, all around the country and talk to young people. And I met, you know, the next Elon Musk, the next prime ministers, the kids who want to go to university, the kids with big, big dreams. But I also met such a large number of young people saying, I want a great job in my town. I want to trade. I want to do, you know, whatever it was. And we need to be meeting those ambitions, um, you know, with the opportunities that we're providing as a nation. So, uh, so I really have, have been calling for a stronger focus on vocational routes such as apprenticeship and better careers in education. And I think we need to bring schools and workplaces closer together, helping children achieve their ambition of a good job or career when they grow up. One of my big focuses has been on girls and STEM. Um, and we've been looking closely at STEM careers because I think our young women are still underrepresented in maths, physics, chemistry, A level, maths, physics, A levels particularly, and need those role models. We need to get out there and encourage them in. I, I even opened a post 16 maths school actually, because I was so concerned about this. Um, so, Better World. 
In the Big Ass, children also told me, now this is where they showed their heart, how much they care about their peers, how much they wanted to have a fairer, better world. Nearly 40% of children told me that a healthy environment and planet was their biggest worry for the future, whilst 31% said that fairness in society was a key concern. And that, that fairness question came from lots of angles. It focused on both poverty, it focused on um, race, focused on gender, a range of issues, but fairness at the bottom of it. In the face of many challenges, including a global pandemic, climate change, ongoing inequality, this generation of young people are ambitious, socially conscious and passionate. And I'm dedicated to hearing directly from them about the issues that matter most to them. And we have a, we, I'm just starting an advisory board and a care experience to advisory board. So if you have any recommendations, do send them to me of young people. And we'll continue to look for opportunities to put their views about the environment and about fairness in our country right at the center. Health was another major theme. It was clear from the big ask that children today value their mental and physical well-being and recognize how important good mental and physical health is as part of a good childhood and a successful adulthood. They're so much more aware of this than we were, well, maybe, certainly I was when I was young. Whilst the majority of children surveyed told us they were happy, which is good news, mental health was one of the biggest worries for children, especially for teenage girls and the older teenage girls especially. You watched it go up in terms of the responses. 14, 15, 16, by 16, 17, the most unhappy. And what children mean when they talk about their mental health is a wide spectrum, encompassing everyday emotions like sadness and worries all the way through to fully diagnosed conditions like eating disorders. And we've all seen what's been happening with the rise of eating disorders during lockdown and seeing that continue. I've been to every children's hospital and, and you know, been speaking with health about this. In every area of my work, whether that's my ambition for 100% school attendance, for all children in care to have a loving home or for families to get child care that works for them, the importance of health is a recurring theme. And that's why health has been one of my key priorities since I became children's commissioner. And when it comes to mental health, I want to see the problems addressed as soon as they emerge. Um, that's what children told me. They want to meet, um, meet support, particularly in school, um, you know, be signposted to support for, by that trusted teacher. Uh, they very much see school as the place they want to get help, at least at first. So I also want to understand more about children's experiences of inpatient care. It's my goal that no child should be living in an institution. So as we work towards that aim, I want to ensure institutions are as safe, loving and familial as every child deserves. Over the last few weeks, my office has been visiting mental health units across England to hear what children want from their care and how it can be improved. And these visits will inform our work to ensure that children's voices are at the heart of reforms to the Mental Health Act and wider healthcare systems. Next year, I'm going to be looking at children's health more widely. In the wake of the pandemic and the toll it took on young people's well-being, this is a generation conscious of the artificial dichotomy between mental and physical well-being. And that's why, um, as well as an updated analysis of children's access to, them, to mental health, a report I do every year, I'm going to be exploring some of the pressures on other children's health services. Families tell me that delays in accessing specialist care for their children can place serious strain on family life as well as their children's education. Now, the introduction of the Integrated Care Boards provides us with a real opportunity to place children and families front and centre and make sure that no child falls through the gaps of care. Next year, I want to bring together representatives from every single integrated care board and local authority so that together we can ensure uh, the needs of children are prioritised. I believe that getting the right support in place for a child's health, health has the power to transform every area of their life, from education to family relationships. And I'm going to continue working to make sure that this is a priority. So on to school. That was that big number two in terms of what children felt were both barriers and what they needed to thrive. 
And the one thing I'd say before I talk about schools is, and I think it's worth it, just, just in, those, in that half a million voices of children, children told me they love their teachers. They told me they love school. They might not say that now, um, you know, because they've been back for a while, but they've been kept away from it. And, and, and so it was very positive and sweet, their desire to be back. Now, schools can transform the way children see themselves in the world and help turn aspirations into tangible opportunities and outcomes. And that's what I want for every single child in England, wherever they live, whatever their background. Children told me how much they liked school, how much they missed it during lockdown, that they saw a good education as the gateway to a good career in the future. They didn't tell me that they liked reading Dickens. They told me that they wanted their education to get a great job. And I think that was a strong, really strong message that came through. One child said, people don't realize how much education is important for life in general. If they don't learn in school, they might not be able to enjoy life to the fullest. So that's why I've been absolutely obsessed with attendance this year. I've made it my absolute priority. Speaking as a former teacher and head teacher, I truly believe that children are offered the safest, happiest and securest start to further their ambitions, relationships and learning in school. I previously called for 100% attendance because who do you leave out? It's not because it sounds or looks good. I've never shied away from setting ambitious targets. But if we don't aim for that, who, who do we leave behind? And you know we're at, I was looking at the figures every single week, we're at 92% nationally. That's well behind where we would have been pre-pandemic. And we need to keep our foot on the gas and our focus on this. There have long been concerns about children not being in school, not attending regularly, and there's no doubt from what we hear from schools the pandemic has amplified this. And whilst you know, we have started to return to some semblance of normality, school absences are too high, and especially in special schools, um, an AP that's still in the 80s. You know, we should be, this time of year, 95, 96, would be a, a moderate ambition. So I think it's really, really important. We know the reasons for absence are complex. It's a system issue as well as an individual one. For some, the pandemic's led to disengagement. For some, it's their special educational needs not being met. But let me tell you, in the responses to the big ask of children with special educational needs, where their needs were being met in school, they were happier than the rest of their, the entire cohort overall. So it can be done. Um, and for some, it's, it's you know, lack of appropriate provision. For some, it's mental health concerns. Earlier this month, I published my formal response to the government's Send Green Paper, in which I set out my ambition to ensure all children and young people are getting timely and effective support that reflects their ambitions with a focus on early intervention. I recommended that local authorities be given the statutory duty to arrange alternative provision for young people with Send to end the sudden cliff edge or sudden end of alternative provision support when a child reaches 16. I do not believe that the current system is sufficiently ambitious enough for children. Often a SEND diagnosis is used as an excuse for poor attendance in school, low attainment and poor expectations for higher education and employment. We need to be as ambitious for, for children with SEND as we are for all children. And I believe a diagnosis should simply be one route into further support and the right interventions to ensure a child can achieve their ambitions. The government's review of the SEND system provides us with a golden opportunity to realise children's ambitions more consistently and in doing so improve the experiences of every child. This is particularly true given the concurrent independent review of children's social care, the school's white paper, the introduction of integrated care services and most recently the National Child Safeguarding Practice Review uh, Panel Phase 1 report into safeguarding children with disabilities and complex health needs in residential settings. What a lot of reform. But the vision in these multiple reforms, if we could just do them and do them together in an integrated way, have the potential to transform every child's experience in the education, health and care system. But to be truly transformational, I think they've got to be delivered in unison, not as siloed pieces of work. It's everyone's responsibility to get this right. Children's experiences depend on family, schools, local authorities, and health services working cohesively and towards the same outcomes. Now, I couldn't have come here without speaking to you about something you, we are all passionate about, and that's our children in care. So what did they tell us in the big ask? As I mentioned earlier, 
We were fortunate to receive thousands of responses to the Big S from Children in Care, who told us they predominantly want the things which all other children take, well, which many other children take for granted. A stable, nurturing home, loving relationships, getting into and remaining in a good school. It shouldn't surprise you that, that children in care looked after children wanted exactly the same things that every other child wants. However, sadly, it's these essential elements of a good childhood which are too often missing for children in care or children on the edge of care, a group I'm even more worried about. And it's these fundamentals I want to focus on. It's only right that we give children loving, caring and stable homes, help them into good schools. I'm really passionate for, about that. When we're, when we're um, you know, planning placements for children in care, we should be planning their education as well um, and making sure you know, all, everything they need for a good life is planned um, and, and mental health support as well to help them recover from trauma. And it's vital, yeah. So, Every day, so I have an advocacy helpline, help at hand, and every day it provides practical support to children in care at the, at the most extreme end, you know, children with five, six professionals in their life. And nearly all the children we speak to are struggling with mental health. Nearly all have difficulty accessing timely and consistent help, for, help from CAMS, which has often been a significant trigger for placement breakdown. Most children my team support are not in education. But by far, the most serious and pressing issue my team are encountering is the lack of places for children in care to live. In the Big S, children in care told me how fundamental a loving, supportive foster home is. As one young man told me, from what I've experienced, you can choose your family. I feel very lucky to have people that didn't even know me to take me in from my actual family. It was a godsend that saved mine and my sister's life. And yet there are too many times when children who've already experienced unbearable things are sent to live in places where they cannot feel safe or secure, in temporary accommodation or with large groups of people they don't know. I think about the 17-year-old girl my team work with who was self-harming due to the trauma she'd faced, who was placed in a rented house with agency staff because nothing else could be found despite prolonged searching by the local authority. I know none of you believe this is good enough because like me, you have the highest standards for children in care. This cannot wait until any wider reform of the system because children cannot wait. We cannot make improvements to the experiences of children in care if we don't have someone, somewhere, someone and somewhere for them to live, to feel safe, to feel loved and to feel secure. Children repeatedly tell me that what they want is to stay near to family, near to friends, near to their wider networks, to live locally in somewhere that feels as close to a family as possible. And I want to see fewer barriers between the different services so that health, education and home are all integrated. That's what family feels like. So let's make sure the system feels like that too. So I will continue to advocate for these children and their families because I don't believe this issue is getting the attention it requires. Having been um, at the forefront of the education reform movement and seen just how much of a difference if you've got a minister ministerial and government eyes and money following a reform, a, a reform, major reform, I want to see that for these children too and children in care too. The names of Star Hobson and Arthur Labinio Hughes also weigh heavily on my mind, as I know they do on yours. And now new names, the residential special schools, Fullerton House, Wilsick Hall, Wheatley House are added to that list. A reminder that the reform we need to see is urgent. There are children at risk as we sit here today who cannot wait. And earlier this year, I published a policy plan of action setting out the seven core expectations that we as professionals and leaders should meet for every child in a children's home. This includes ensuring children stay close to home, at their school, and keep links with their friends and family. And of course, in the long term, I don't want any child growing up in an institution. I'm also committed to supporting children leaving care, and sadly I've heard from many care leavers that the thought of their 18th birthday fills them with dread rather than excitement as they face that cliff edge of care falling away. And, and I have set out my ambitions to ensure every care leaver has a stable, suitable home and support from and, and can sustain loving relationships with carers and professionals who support them. 
It's interesting. I talked to so many care leavers around the country, and the two things they all tell me that they remember when they look back is the day they were taken into care and what, what they were told, because often they were actually caring for their relatives in difficult situations. And secondly, that teacher who actually may talk to them, acknowledge them, made that little bit of space for them, or that professional, we have a massive impact on these young people's lives. And I think we need to, to rocket boost that. So let me finish by saying, just as a parent would for their own child, I want every one of us working with children to be aiming at not just good enough, but the best possible outcome. I want all of you to feel, feel empowered to challenge a decision that isn't ambitious enough or in a child's best interests. I'm committed to pushing for the changes we need to see at policy level. The reforms to family support that will mean more families are given the genuine help that means they can stay together. The changes to the children's social care system that will mean when they can't, there are truly loving alternatives. Until that time, I want all of us here today to commit to never giving up on advocating for our children, for making sure their voices are heard, their views known and their rights respected. I will be with you in that, so that in the years to come, we can look back with pride at what we've achieved. Now, I want to end with the words, the final words of our Big Ask survey from a young man, a 16-year-old. So when we asked children what was holding them back in England in 2021 when we did the survey, a 16-year-old boy told us something sad. The social stigma of children from lower class backgrounds trying to achieve something bigger than themselves. Let me read that again. 2021, children from lower class backgrounds trying to achieve something bigger than themselves. We should of course tell him that there is nothing bigger than the lives of children. So not to scorn ambition, we could try to build something equal to it. Take those dreams, those arrows of desire sent out of sight and somewhere make them real. Thank you. Thank you. Well Thank you. Thank you. Um, a lot of uh, thought for all of us, I'm sure, and I'm sure there's nobody in the room that doesn't concur with most of the findings. Um, but if we can just come back and do a few questions if you're, if you're happy with that. I, I mean, from the CCN's perspective, we've uh, answered all of those uh, initiatives that government have sent round and uh, worked quite hard with Josh McAllister on his report. <clears throat> so rather than going through uh, all of them individually, can I just ask you a simple question? Do you think the government are getting it? Because uh, to, to actually do the preventative uh, work that we all know uh, helps children, keeps families together, uh, and more importantly uh, for us, uh, frees up some of the uh, foster parents that we all need vitally to look after the children that can't be uh, safely kept at home. Do you think government are getting it? We're awaiting a, a response, of course. Yeah, so... Um, so, uh, so, great question. Um, I'm on the National Implementation Board that are tasked with making sure government get it. Um, I, think, um, I think there is definitely a sense of momentum and urgency. Um, I think a response has been planned. Um, but I think... I think it's the urgency now I want to see more of. So I'm working closely with Claire Coutinho, the new, um, the new children's minister, um, to really, I, I, think, I think when you ask the government get it, I think individuals do, but I think we need treasury to get it. We need to make sure our data case um, and, our, and our case for, our real case for change is compelling. Um, so I think we've got a job to do. Um, because, you know, worthy words are fine, but we need to see change now, don't we? Excellent. Thank you. Um, I've got a whole list of, uh, of questions for you, but we'll start with one. Uh, the recommendations in your presentation are very commendable. However, they can't be delivered effectively on a shoestring budget. So what plans are there for focusing proper funding for children's services to bring about the changes that you highlight? I guess that's a similar answer to the last one. Yeah, it is, but I, I also think... Um, Again, having been through, I think I mentioned, having been through significant sort of public sector reform in education, um, I think there's something about um, 
the way we ask for that funding and ensuring that we really make the case, um, both in terms of, you, you know, I think there's some, if it's not just we need more money, of course we do, and I want, I absolutely want funds to come into this area. I think there is a moment now where we should be making the case, um, and that case for reform, um, you know, it's often tricky, but we need to get, we need to make sure we've got the data points. I'm working hard just looking at mapping nationally what's going on and looking at, at the data there and what, where's the evidence, where's the evidence base. Um, and I think get that, I mean, half a million children's voices has, has made um, uh, cabinet ministers sit up. And I think you need to be doing the same thing. Excellent. No, I, think, I think half a million uh, children speaking to you is commendable. So well done with that. Um, should, should councils consider stopping using some of the global IT platforms in order to show support and resolve for the need for online safety for children and young people? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, so I, I guess, I guess um, my answer to this, I mean, everyone must do what, must do what they do. I think m what I try, I'm trying to do is make sure that the um, tech companies themselves who know how old children are on, on their sites, um, who, who could solve this problem straight away, um, step up and take responsibility. Now, I think self-regulation has failed. I think we do need legislation. I, I personally uh, think it probably wouldn't make that much difference, but, but you should actually, you, I think you absolutely could let the tech companies know what you think. Now, that's powerful, and I'd be very happy to channel that through to them. Thank you. We have a question from the floor. Thank you. Thank you. It follows on perhaps rather neatly from that one. Um, my name's Lucy Nettersinger and I'm the chair, the leader of Cambridgeshire County Council. I'm also on the um, LGA's Children and Young People's Board as a deputy chair. Um, I wanted to thank you for the work that you've been doing on the online safety bill um, and uh, on particularly on focusing on the impact of pornography on children. Um, I think it's really important and I think that we don't talk about it very much. Um, and I think it's very important not only because of the impact that it has on comparatively young children when they stumble across things they definitely shouldn't, but also because actually many of our teenagers and young people are now learning about um, normal sexual behaviour from the internet and what they're learning about is not normal. Um, and it's having an impact on assaults on young women and on what young men think is acceptable behaviour. Um, and that's often... Uh, just as traumatic and horrendous for the young men involved as it is for the young women when they find themselves involved in the criminal justice system when they thought that what they were doing was just what was okay and it isn't. Um, so, so I wanted to thank you for the work that you're doing on that um, and I wanted to know what more we as councils can do to help in that space because it is a difficult space for us to talk about um, and whether there is more that schools can be doing to help inform parents about having conversations with children, because part of it is about um, having better ways to, for children to find out about these things that are not just exploring stuff on the internet. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's a great question. Uh, we could talk all day, couldn't we? It's um, so, so absolutely. I mean, my um, research and conversations with children are, are showing that that what you describe there are absolutely the, is absolutely the case. I, uh, I brought recently um, 100 uh, 16 to 21 year olds into the DfE to do a session, what I wish my parents had known. Um, and they actually wrote a fantastic booklet. It's online. It's really useful, actually, if you wanted to flag it up because they went through, you know, uh, and in that, that particular group, you know, they um, you know, just, just the experiences that children had had, like, like my, one girl told me my first, first kiss with a, a new boy, with a boyfriend, you know, um, and he put his uh, uh, arms around my neck and tried to strangle me because he'd seen that on a, a porn video and thought that, you know, I mean, that's what we're talking about. It's, it's not, and I, th I think boys and girls have been the victim of that. So, and I mean, we've done research, nationally representative research. We've, we've looked at, you know, 
the high likelihood of eight to nine year olds being, sh even if, even if mom and dad have put, um, or carers have put um, parental controls on, the high likelihood of someone at school or someone showing them something on their phone, um, you know, pornography, and how do we, how, you know, and, and the shock and the upset of that. Um, and we're currently doing some work with, as I mentioned, with the uh, Sarks clinics on how pornography is actually affecting assault. Uh, on girls. So, you know, I can't emphasize how much of an issue this is. Um, I'm broadening it. 2000, uh, we did a, a survey of 2000 children in March, 50% of them had seen something that was worrying or concerning online, in, you know, including the categories, the main categories being pornography, um, violence, gore, uh, you know, um, extreme dieting you know it, it's it's really really is wild out there um so what can we do um as i say we need the tech companies to step up and hopefully legislation as well um so i think we're pushing hard for that i think schools can do a huge amount um and i think I, i've been talking to head teachers head teachers groups uh, the confederation of school trusts um, and the, i think they really are often seeking support uh, in, in how to do this. So one of the things I'm doing at the moment is looking at the RSE curriculum and how we can ensure this is well taught in the RSE and PSHE curriculum, ensuring there are good materials, but it's also school ethos as well, isn't it? Um, I personally, you know, you'll, if you read the Telegraph this weekend, you might know <laughs> I'm quite in favour of really um, getting a hold of this issue of every child having an internet connected phone because parents are worried about them walking home from school and not being able to contact them we'll get non-internet connected phones just stand up to it we don't need to mm. give our kids this you know what we can give them the best of the internet without giving them that so there's great education there's stuff that families need to do um i think around this and one of the things in what my i wish my parents had known that those 16 21 year olds said was uh parents you know as a mom of a 27 year old this really rang true for me actually um you know when when you come home from school and your mom asks you you were right or you don't you know how was your day and you sort of grunt at them that the, the, the child sort of grunts at the, the, the children so basically keep asking mm -hmm. we need our parents to put the structures around us not let us use this stuff at night manage you know have understand what's on there so i think there's a big parental job but also something around education and as councils your advice being able to give advice and support on that and there's certainly children's commissioners materials we we could put there i do think this is uh, a massively underestimated issue i everywhere i go and i talk to thousands and thousands of children whatever social background i've even had you know, little uh, little chats from uh, the, the, some of Britain's uh, most expensive public schools come and talk to me about the mess they've got into a, on it. You know, every it's not this isn't and this is a ubiquitous issue, um, and I think we really do need to act on it. Thank Sorry. you. Uh, I've got a whole handful of, uh, of questions and whatever, but I've got no time, so I'll take the one uh, gentleman's got a, a microphone in front of him and been waiting. Sorry, it's a really interesting session, but. Uh, we must bring it to an end sooner or later. So please give your question, last question for today. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Parry from uh, Dorset Council, the Cabinet Member for Children and Education. Something that was not referred to in your presentation, and to be fair, a generation ago was un almost unheard of, but today represents quite a large uh, equivalent of a primary school population, is elective home education. Um, now, this is probably, to my mind, ripe for uh, some form of uh, serious scrutiny and consideration going forward. It strikes me that the powers of the local authority uh, belong in the last century. Uh, and how do we go, uh, you know, what measures need to come forward to allow us the opportunity to provide that scrutiny and accountability? And ultimately, how would that be funded? Yeah. So um, I think it's fairly, probably fairly well known that my view is um, that we should have uh, elective home education register. Um, obviously, it's a parent's right to be able to educate their child at home. Some do that incredibly well, but they're not the ones we're worried about, are they? It's the 
thousands and thousands of children who are out of school not getting the quality of education they uh, they need and you know frankly my view is most of those children would be far better off in school so i think and at the first legislative opportunity um, that commitment in it's only draft at the moment but in that school's white paper to uh, bringing in a bringing in um, a proper register and the checks needed because the register is one thing but it's actually been able to get out there it is where I would put my pound as well um, so I have been regularly speaking to ministers and secretaries of state we've had quite a few um, but making the case for um, financial support for this as well Thank you very much. Can I thank you all and can, can we thank again? Uh, <laughs>